Hi, I'm Bob Herbert. Welcome to OpEd.TV. In the endless discussions about serial killings and other outbreaks of violence in America, one of the most important issues is seldom mentioned, the unmistakable links between hatred of women, masculine insecurity, and the violence that saturates our society. Those elements were explicit in the recent case of Elliot Roger, the college student in a small town near Santa Barbara, California, who killed six people and wounded 13 others before turning his gun on himself. In video postings and a book-length manifesto, Roger declared that females truly have something mentally wrong with them. Sex, he said, the very word fills me with hate. He vowed to, quote, punish all females for the crime of depriving me of sex. There is absolutely nothing new about this hideous misogynistic madness. In August 2009, a 48-year-old man named George Sedini opened fire in a fitness center at a mall 10 miles south of Pittsburgh. He killed three women and injured nine others before killing himself. Sedini had written in his blog, I dress good, am clean shaven, bathe, touch of cologne, yet 30 million women rejected me. Two years before that, the gunman who killed 32 people in a campus rampage at Virginia Tech was reported to have previously stalked and sexually harassed female classmates. There are myriad examples. We'll talk about these and other factors contributing to the violence that James Gilligan, a psychiatrist and professor at NYU School of Medicine, who has spent most of his adult life studying violence in America. Jim, welcome, and thanks so much uh, for being here. Thank you. Uh, Jim, for you've, been the, me. you've been the director of mental health for the Massachusetts prison system. Um, you've written books on violence. You've spent, uh, you spent three decades, more than three decades, I guess, as a professor up at the Harvard Medical School. Uh, you've uh, known a lot of violent offenders. Just how pervasive is this link between misogyny, I think in some cases homophobia as well, and violence in America? I would say it's essentially universal. I, th I think that a, a necessary, although not in itself sufficient cause of violence, wherever it occurs, is, uh, and let me s concentrate first by speaking of men, because mm -hmm. men are the primary perpetrators of violence. Most murders and suicides and wars are, you know, perpetrated by men. But what is common to this violence is feelings of male sexual inadequacy, that I'm not man enough, and I'm not man enough to attract women. Uh, and there's, uh, uh, you mentioned homophobia, which is also absolutely relevant here. I think in every home side I've seen, even if it didn't involve between men or whatever. Um, there's an underlying fear of not being an adequate man, and for homophobic men, that is a fear that they, that they are or will be perceived as gay. So I'd say misogyny and homophobia are really part of the same complex of feelings of inadequacy as a man. And this is compounded, of course, by the easy access to guns that we have in our society. Oh, absolutely. Um, and I, I, I would say, on the one hand, that cannot be overemphasized. On the other hand, it's also true that even if we had no guns in America, we would still have homicide rates that, even af after you subtra subtract the gun homicides, our homicide rates would still be three to four times as high as they are in any other developed country. Uh, or even take this recent case with Elliot Roger, uh, he killed uh, two uh, roommates uh, by stabbing them, even right. without using guns. Right. So yes, we, we, we need fewer guns in our society. That would lead to fewer homicides and suicides and gun accidents that cause death. But even without that, we have a culture of violence in America that is without parallel in the rest of the uh, economically developed world. You know, um, I, I think it's just not well understood, these sort of um, psychosexual underpinnings to these um, attacks, these atrocities that have gotten so much attention, and yet that aspect of it, it has not gotten a lot of attention. I remember back in 2006, 
when there were the killings at the Amish uh, schoolhouse in, in, in Pennsylvania and the killer lined up the uh, students, boys on one side, girls on the other side, and shot 10 of the girls, actually killing five of them. Um, this, the, we, I mentioned the fellow George Sedini, the guy uh, who uh, invaded the fitness center in, uh, outside of Pittsburgh. This is something that he wrote in his, his blog. Uh, why do this to young girls? It seems many teenage girls have sex frequently. One 16-year-old does it usually three times a day with her boyfriend. So after a month of that, this little expletive has had more sex than me in my entire life, and I am 48. One more reason. So it seems like so many of these characters, I mean, they resent the, the sexual activity or the sexual pleasure that, that others are having, and, and this drives them into some a murderous rage. Can you explain the connection between, why is this rage so intense and why does it so often lead to these outbursts of hideous violence? Well, I'd say the, the main psychological underlying cause of violence is feelings of shame and humiliation. And I'm using shame as a kind of a generic word, like we use the word flower. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, there are lots of flowers, roses and daffodils and so on. Shame comes in many flavors, feelings of being inadequate, inferior, uh, of being insulted and disrespected, of being rejected, of being treated as uh, uh, inadequate or un unimportant or insignificant and so forth and so on. The language that runs through all of these manifestos, that runs through the 141-page manifesto that Elliot Roger left and all these other uh, statements, it's the feeling of shame and humiliation that, in all its synonyms, uh, is the underlying factor. And uh, that's why uh, I, I've been interested in kind of translating uh, common moral statements into psychological descriptive statements. And you know, we're all familiar with the old moral statement, love your neighbor as yourself. What I would say is that, in fact, that's a psychological description of what we already do. People do love their neighbors exactly as themselves, whether they want to or not, or are aware of it or not. Meaning that when I see somebody who treats other people with disrespect and with anger and rejects them, that's a sign that the person himself lacks self-respect. If, if you don't love other people, it's a sign you don't love yourself. What, what conceals that often is the people who are, feel most shamed and humiliated will bend over backwards to conceal the fact that they feel shamed and humiliated because nothing is more shameful than to experience shame. So they will conceal it as Elliot Roger did in his manifesto by how great I am and how much I'm underestimated by other people. But clearly his own feelings uh, about himself were of are just absolute failure as a man. Do we have an understanding of what causes these intense feelings of shame and, and, and why that's so pervasive or this, uh, um, this uh, loss of self-respect? Where does that come from? Well, one place it comes from I discovered by working with violent inmates in the San Francisco jails, about half of whom were in for domestic violence against their wives or girlfriends. Um, what we discovered was that these men were operating on the basis of really an unconscious set of beliefs. We call it the male role belief system, that the world was divided into the superior and the inferior, and that in that division, men were supposed to be superior and women were supposed to be inferior. Uh, although in addition to that, a really adequate man would be superior to other men as well. So this. This ideology is a recipe for violence, and it produced violence. When we engaged in intensive group psychotherapy with these men, they began to realize they had a set of assumptions they weren't even aware they had. They, they just took it for granted, like the, uh, the air you breathe or uh, the water that fish swim in. I mean, it's, you don't even, aren't even aware of it. When they became aware of that, they began to realize how absurd that was. It's totally illogical, totally arbitrary. And because that had been their unconscious beliefs and they'd acted on those, they had ruined their own lives as well as the lives of other people. They were in jail. And in fact, these 
big tough men would break down in tears sometimes because of their sadness of, at having destroyed a relationship with a woman that they actually wanted to have a relationship with. So you, so you mentioned domestic violence, and of course, you know, we've been talking about serial killers and these sort of enormous atrocities, but of course, um, there's all kinds of uh, violence and um, other aspects of humiliation inflicted on uh, women just all the time, I mean, all day, every day in, in this society. And it, it would seem to me that, that these, there's a similar underpinning to that, these feelings of shame, the rage, and, and that sort of thing. How do you begin to combat that? I mean, this is an enormous problem and an, an enormously tragic problem in, in our society. How do you begin to combat that as a society? Well, I would say I would do what we did in the San Francisco jails, which is to deconstruct and reconstruct the gender role belief system, the notion of how you define masculinity and femininity, what men should be able to expect from women and women uh, from men, um, and, and to reconstruct that so that men are not ashamed if they don't have six girlfriends or uh, if they're still a virgin at whatever age, uh, and so that they won't feel they have to humiliate women in order to ward off their own feelings of humiliation. Now, one difference between men and women, I, I think, is that men actually in our society tend to be rewarded for violence, and women tend not to be. Um, I've uh, sometimes thought of uh, uh, paraphrasing something uh, Bernard Shaw said once when he, he said that if a man steals 100 pounds, he gets sent to jail. If he steals 100,000 pounds, he gets sent to parliament. <laughs> and uh, I would paraphrase that by saying when a man kills one person, he gets sent to prison. He kills 10, he gets sent to a prison mental hospital. If he kills 100,000, he gets named uh, Emperor of Rome or Duke of Marlborough or elected President of the United States. We, we, we honor men for violence and we punish them for nonviolence. We call them deserters or cowards or whatever. So we, we have a culture of violence that says to men, you're not really a man unless you have the courage to engage in violence with other people, toward other people, and thus provoke them to be violent in return. Now you've been studying this sort of thing for many years, um, and the, the, there's quite a bit of literature out there. I mean, this is not just you know coming you know from the sky or something like that. Why have we not paid more attention to this? And, and, and when these um, these terrible uh, acts of violence occur, uh, why isn't this aspect of it picked up more by media? Do you think? I think part of it is we don't want to give up our violence. Um, when I was asked by the town of Fayetteville, North Carolina, to have a, a book I wrote called Preventing Violence, read by everybody in the community, so there would be a, a communal discussion of violence in the community, uh, one of the members of the uh, uh, town board was uh, a member of the military staff of Fort Bragg, which is in Fayetteville. He said, well, I'm not sure we want to prevent violence. After all, we're training uh, Marines or whatever the, the group was uh, to, uh, uh, to commit acts of violence. Um, he didn't want to give it up. Uh, ironically, within a matter of months, uh, there were several murders that in effect amounted to casualties of the soldiers in the fort. So the, the fact is they really did need to learn right. what was causing violence and how to prevent it. But as a country, you know, we often don't want to. We still have guns so that people can shoot intruders uh, without having to, to try to escape or call the police or whatever. They can just shoot them and kill them. We want to keep the option of, of killing people. Well, and of course, um, violence is an essential component of so much of our uh, entertainment um, systems, uh, uh, movies, uh, books, uh, video games. Um, it's um, what's sort of played up on the, uh, the news uh, every night. Uh, it's a staple of the tabloids. Now, I'm not in favor of censorship, and I've had an entire career that's been based on the freedoms uh, that are guaranteed by the First Amendment. But um, it's hard not to believe that this uh, sort of um, glorification of violence does not have an effect. 
Uh, how do you begin to combat some of that? Now, I, I would agree with you that I don't think censorship, governmental censorship is the answer. Because when the government starts censoring, uh, they often censor the very things we think don't <laughs> right. need to be censored and don't censor the ones we would. Uh, I, I think, but you know, you've asked the $64,000 question. How do you change a culture? Because this is a culture of violence that we're talking about. I'm trying to do it through changing the ways that people think and feel, and thoughts and feelings, of course, are, you know, affect each other, uh, by alerting people to the degree to which we shame men if they aren't aggressive enough, uh, or if they aren't sexually successful enough. Um, when we do that, we increase the level of violence against women. And, uh, but there are many ways that, uh, that both men and women get shamed in our society. My, th my sense is the underlying principle that I would like to universalize to the degree we can, and I used to insist on this with the mental health teams I worked with in prisons and jails, was respect for every person you interact with. No matter who they are, what they've done, at least you treat them with respect. When we were working with violent criminals in prisons, obviously we didn't approve of what they had done that got them sent to prison, but we had to treat them as human beings and not strip them of all human dignity, which is what prisons you know, tend to do. You know, it's really interesting. In, in all the criminals I've <laughs> ever covered in a long career in journalism, inevitably, and some of these were pretty horrible human beings, inevitably their acts were sort of grounded in a, a demand for respect, or at least what yeah. they perceived as um, the way you should, uh, a person or they should be treated. Yeah. I mean, respect is, is, is really a big deal. Um, we, we mentioned guns. Um, I mean, I guess we have as many guns in, in this country as we have people yes. uh, now. Uh, it, it doesn't appear that much headway can be made on gun control. If we, did, if we did manage to have some serious forms of gun control, do you think that that would help significantly? And, but two, is the genie just out of the bottle in terms of guns? Are there so many guns out there now that almost nothing that you can do will help? Well, I think the, the degree to which we have guns and gun ownership in America is not only a cause of violence, it's also a symptom or a consequence of the culture of violence that I mentioned a moment ago. As long as we have a culture of violence, we're gonna have more guns and we'll use them more. If we can change the culture, I think the guns themselves uh, would become less uh, dangerous because they wouldn't be used as much. On the other hand, uh, I absolutely think that one way we'll know the culture is changing is when we decide to not have so many guns or at least to start getting rid of the ammunition that, uh, uh, that, that would, uh, make the guns usable. <laughs> that was actually Senator, the late Senator Daniel Patrick <laughs> right. Moynihan's recommendation was, don't worry about the guns, get rid of the ammunition. Right. The, you know, um, you've been studying this for a, a really long time. What drew you personally to psychiatry, and then how did you get into the study of the violent aspects of our culture? Well, there, with me, there was, as any psychiatrist, uh, might say there was both a conscious and an unconscious motivation. The conscious one was uh, when I first uh, took a, uh, an elective rotation in my psychiatric training and something I'd never heard of before called prison psychiatry. And I was treating violent criminals in Massachusetts state prisons. I was amazed to discover that uh, this was the most moving experience I'd had in psychiatry and I really got hooked. The unconscious motivation was um, that as a child, I had a father who was very violent, <laughs> uh, particularly toward my two brothers, more, more than to me. And I, I realized that from the time I was a child, I, I devoted my life to trying to become a peacemaker and to get the violence stopped. And I realized I'm still doing something. And <laughs> I started doing it at age six or so. Now, you think that um, we can pretty effectively, obviously not always, but um, uh, pretty effectively identify individuals who are likely to commit violent acts. Is that correct? Absolutely. I, I get very frustrated when I read, uh, including statements by many psychiatrists, that 
you know, we cannot identify the people that are, uh, that are dangerous, and uh, we might as well give up on that. Uh, I think, in fact, we do know how to prevent violence. Uh, it's easier to prevent it on a statistical scale than with each individual, but I, I can give you multiple examples of abilities to reduce the, the incidence of violence in, a, in, in any group you give me. The work I did with the jails in San Francisco, we were able, through this intensive psychotherapeutic work, we had these guys in programs six days a week, 12 hours a day, the rate of violence within the jail dropped to zero. The rate of violent reoffending after they left the jail was 83% lower than it was in a closely matched control group in an ordinary jail. Uh, I could give you other examples with domestic violence, uh, uh, crisis intervention groups, uh, working in communities all over the country. Uh, we do know how to prevent violence. We just have not had the political will yet to introduce the, the, the changes and to give the support and resources. And some of the, if you could get those resources and had the support, some of those steps that would lead to a reduction in violence would be what? Well, I've divided it in, into the standard preventive medicine model of primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention. Primary prevention would mean cleaning up our political and economic system, reducing the amount of, of economic and social inequality, which is the most powerful predictor of violence throughout the world. Uh, get rid of racial discrimination, economic inequality, uh, uh, gender inequality, uh, you name it. Secondary prevention is intervening with people who are at risk of violence before they become violent. For example, there are good studies showing that uh, intensive work with poverty-stricken single mothers in poverty-ridden, crime-ridden neighborhoods are powerfully eff effective if you provide prenatal counseling, uh, postnatal home visits, uh, uh, preschool for the children that are born, and, and so forth, you reduce the level not only of child abuse, but also of juvenile delinquency and adult crime. So we can, we can prevent uh, when we identify people at risk of violence from becoming violent. Thirdly, w working with people who have already become violent, which is what I've done mostly, working with criminals in prisons and jails. Uh, we know how to do that. For example, education. We found the most effective single program for preventing violent reoffending in the Massachusetts prisons was getting a college degree while in prison. The group that got a degree was 100% successful in avoiding being sent back to prison for a new crime over a 25-year period. Um, I spoke earlier that we don't have the political will, however, to implement these things. After I reported on this finding in Massachusetts, our new Republican governor stopped the program, saying that uh, if, if we gave a free college education to prisoners, then poor people who couldn't go to college would start committing crimes so they could see <laughs> send to prison to get a free college education. And then the Newt Gingrich Congress, the 1994 Congress, eliminated the Pell Grants for prisoners throughout the country, which provided free college tuition and textbooks for prisoners throughout the country. So, in the name of being tough on crime, our right-wing politicians succeeded in dismantling the most effective single program we've yet discovered for enabling people to gain the self-respect they need in order to start respecting other people and live a nonviolent life. Going backwards instead of going forward. Exactly. This has been terrific. Thank you so much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. Uh, we'll be back in a moment with a final word.